All right, we're good. So, without further ado, uh, Dr. Kate Hall of the Geological Survey will present her talk Permian Pumice to Miocene Magma. Uh, I'll just let you take it away. All right, thanks very much. Thanks everybody for coming. Um, I need to point out that although I'm the one presenting, this is a, definitely a collaborative effort um, between myself and Alexa Trotson, who's sitting in the audience. So at the end, you can throw questions at either of us. And this is really work from both of us. Um, all right, so what is this about? Well, um, let me give you a little background. We're going to talk about Warren Bungle National Park and a project that we did to, to map it. Um, the park is, as many of you know, located about 355 kilometers northwest of Sydney and about 30 kilometers west of Coonabara Brand. Um, this whole project got inspired because there was a huge bushfire, as many of you know, in 2013. It devastated 95% of the park and destroyed the visitor center. Um, there was a 3D model of the park that was just barely saved, and uh, the survey is now coming up with uh, creating a new one. But um, this then inspired OEH, the Office of Environment and Heritage, to do post-fire recovery and uh, scientific research and recovery. Um, all of a sudden, as they're doing this, they realize the geology map is definitely insufficient. That was public accessible um, to, in order to do their soil maps. And the soil maps, of course, relate to the vegetation recovery. So that's what started it, was Liz Tasker of OEH, who was just downstairs with us but couldn't stay. She um, kind of got this thing going. And she then uh, uh, contracted Alexa. Alexa then contacted us. We got involved. And one of our motivations, we being the survey, um, got involved because we were also, coincidentally, um, about to fly an airborne geophysical survey to do magnetics and radiometrics in this um, Empty region was, is one of the places that hadn't been done yet in the state for coverage. And so um, that was one of the big motivations for the survey to get involved, because they're already doing geophysics. And also because, obviously, it's iconic ge geology. It's a park based on geology, and yet we don't have a detailed map. Um, and there's also, of course, geotourism potential. So beautiful features like the bread knife and the blue and blue tree spire, which are well known. Uh, the park is outlined in white. You'll see this um, as the defined outline of the park through a lot of the visuals here. All right. So what what do we know about um, Warren Bungle National Park and the geology? Well, what we do know and have known from previous studies is that it's a young. There's a young. Uh, uh, lineage of young volcanoes on the east coast of Australia. There's also two tracks, um, linears of volcanoes on off the actual coast, submarine volcanoes. Now, um, these ten, these trend from, of course, Queensland all the way down to Tasmania, and they're known to be hotspot volcanoes. Now, um, we have called these three tracks in the past, but now with this new continent of Zealandia, which has been identified, it is controversial. I, some people don't believe in it, but if you do, then there's only basically two tracks. And you can, this is complicated. Um, some might say there's more than one track, but basically that's kind of the scenario we're looking at. Now there are several volcano types. Um, on the Australian continent, um, subaerially, and 
Uh, one of the types are these yellow ones, which are, have been called central volcanoes. They're a type of shield volcano. And they young, as you'll notice, if you can read these ages, they young from, uh, south, from north to south. So they get younger to the south. And of course, this is because they're hot spots, which I'll explain here in a moment. Uh, Warren Bungle is located here, and it's, um, it's about, it's between 15 and 18 million, million years, and that has done recent, most recent dating was argon-argon by Cohen. Um, there were some potassium argon dates that get started at 13, but um, these are probably a little bit more precise. So that's what we're looking at, it's, it's what we know. Well, what is a hotspot volcano? Probably most of you know, but um, I'm just going to go over it anyway. Um, the central volcano type is uh, it's kind of a local term to Australia, actually, I've discovered. But it's a kind of shield. It's a complex kind of shield. Uh, generally, you have your basaltic lavas that are not very viscous. They tend to form uh, these big, large domes or dome shapes that are shaped like an old warrior's shield. That's why they're called. Hawaii is a perfect example. And these things, of course, were created by a hot uh, mantle plume. And I'll get into that in a second. But the thing with, with central volcanoes is they are these big shields that then seem to have a more complicated stage where you get a lot of felsic uh, intrusions, lavas, and other um, volcanic rocks that are a little bit later in the evolution of the volcano. So that's, they're very similar to the Turkana region in Kenya. Um, and again, they're formed by hot spots. Now, um, Mauna Loa is the classic hot spot in Hawaii that um, is actually the biggest mountain in the world uh, if you go from base to top. So Hawaii is a perfect example of the hot spot. Uh, they're intraplate, they're in the middle, uh, not on the margins like subduction zone volcanoes. They tend to form a chain, and that's because you have this, uh, what has been uh, classically called a mantle plume. And if you start looking into the literature, it's kind of fun because people call them vortexes, and then they say, no, they're not vortexes, they're buoyant, fluid-filled demons. That's my favorite. <laughs> So basically, you've got volatiles, and you've got fluids, and the stuff, for some reason, rises up, heats up the lower crust, and the, because the plate keeps moving, you get a burning through, and you get a chain of volcanoes. Now, I'm sure at the end of this, Kelsey's going to tell me that I'm completely wrong, but she can do that with the... Uh... So Hawaii is a classic um, example. Okay, so we know we have a hotspot volcano. In... Prior to this study, what was the state of the geology of Warren Bungle National Park, of the volcano itself? Well, uh, it was pretty basic. Um, we knew that there was stratigraphy of the Permo Triassic Gunadaw Basin and the overlying Surat Basin, and then we had these Miocene uh, Warren Bungle volcanic rocks. And um, at this point, there was just a little bit of Permian that uh, cropped out in there and a little bit to the north that is too small to show on this. Uh, we knew that the, the Surat Basin were these various greens and uh, there were some Garawilla volcanics um, off to the margins. And, and then the uh, Warm Bungle volcanics were basically for the majority of the park undifferentiated. And we had a little bit of basalt, and we had some trachytes off to the outside of the park in the margin. So that's where we stood before we started this project. Okay, so what did we use to sort of build our map on? We used a lot of um, previous studies. There were quite a few. And uh, Alexa did an amazing job of, of finding all these and compiling them. Um, one of the biggest areas that got attention was uh, work done by Hockley. He did a PhD. That was his map area. Uh, that was the map, but as you can see, it didn't, it isn't quite georeferenced correctly, and uh, that's about all we have. So, um, plus his petrological data. 
There were a bunch of honor stasis, but every one of them were just sort of these small little detailed areas. And none of this had ever been all put together and uh, into a nice map. Um, there are also sketch maps uh, done by Duggan and Knudsen, uh, Knudsen of GA, I think Duggan was too, um, and also Paul Ashley. So there were these um, detailed pockets, and so we had that. And then we had geochemical analyses that were done from these, mostly from these theses, that was then compiled and a lot of the data were put into a, the OSCHEM G, GA database. We had uh, water and exploration bore data. So there's, that's the sort of, uh, the, those kind of data we had. And then we had remotely sensed data. We had, of course, aerial image, images. We also, thankfully, had LIDAR that OEH flew. And uh, that is absolutely mind-boggling if any of you haven't used it before. This is an example um, looking at an area that is mostly Pilaga sandstone. You can see every pimple on the surface here with that LIDAR. And in fact, if you see, notice these linear features, Alexa very astutely noted that a lot of them are quite linear. And in fact, after field checking them, they're all dikes. And I'll go into that later, but this is the kind of value that the LIDAR gave to working with the GIS. We also then, the Airborne Geophysics Survey that I was mentioning got flown. While we were working on the project, uh, we had, uh, this is an example of the total magnetic intensity. So we had quite a bit of data. The, the sharp uh, units tend to be mag highs that are right on the surface. The more dull ones seem to be deeper because this works, mag uh, magnetics are up to hundreds of meters deep, but we also had radiometrics, which is the top 20 centimeters. So um, this is examples where you have the felsic volcanic rocks are the white and the Pilaga sandstone, for example. Uh, the underlying Jurassic sandstones were blue and green. So this is kind of stuff that in conjunction with the LIDAR was hugely helpful. A uh, close-in example of combining the radiometrics and the LIDAR, you can see here, beautiful detail of the mafic lavas in dark reds and purples and the felsic, uh, felsic dome in this case that have uh, all elements, uh, potassium, uranium, thorium, and they come out white. So that was incredibly helpful in terms of mapping because we couldn't get everywhere. At first, we started out with getting one week of field work. That's what we were given. <laughs> we ended up with four weeks. So um, anyway, so we also had, as I mentioned, geochemical data. Um, all these data on this plot, except the red squares, are previous studies. You can see that these data, when plotted, this is an uh, anhydrous plot on what we call a TAS diagram. Uh, sodium and potassium versus silica, and it's a very nice single differentiation trend. They're alkaline rocks. They go from basalt to rhyolite, but through trachybasalt, basaltic trachyandesite, trachyandesite, trachyte, trachydacite, trachyte, and rhyolite. So um, really a beautiful differentiation curve. So we had that. Once we plotted some of those data up, thanks to with some help with, uh, by Phil Blevin, you can see that if you use the Raleigh style mineral frac fractionation vectors, so in this case, um, we're cut off here, but uh, if you can see the beautiful differentiation trends. So this is uh, rubidium, I think, and it comes down. You see this beautiful potassium feldspar differentiates mocking this kind of uh, fractionation. So we know that potassium feldspar is fractionated for the felsic rock. So these are really evolved magmas. Um, and then also, if you plot um, mystery elements, and uh, basically <laughs> incompatibles and rare earths, 
at low potassium rubidium ratios, they're very high. So we've got a pretty classic alkaline, highly evolved magmas. All right, so we have those data. Then we started mapping. Uh, the mapping, we used all the public roads. We had a, a survey, four-wheel drive vehicle. Um, off we went. We went on um, many of the walking tracks. These are our field sites, a um, little under 500 of them. Uh, we collected samples for petrography, a uh, couple hundred uh, thin sections I got to go through. And uh, we did, as I showed, those, those five geochemical uh, date. And we did, well, we haven't yet done the dating, but uh, it's actually in the pipe. So we're going to just, just do some shrimp dates to, or laser ablation on some zircons just to sort of see how they jive with the argon-argon. Okay, so what did we find from all this mapping? Let's first look at the mafic deposits. I divided the volcanic rocks, the mafic volcanic rocks, into basically coherent facies. Coherent means something that's crystallized out of a magma, for those of you who aren't in the volcanological terminology, which is most people. Um, coherent facies, so lavas, sills, dikes, anything that's crystallized out of a magma. There's also volcanoclastic facies. Uh, that are mafic, and most of those are spatter type deposits. You'll see them in a minute, but these are the kind of things that you'll get that uh, fire fountains and, and uh, spatter kind of deposits. In hand sample, these, these basalts, they're very dark green in the middle from chlorite. They tend to have vesicular margins and have uh, dense cores. They're the least viscous of the lavas, so they most aerially extensive in the volcano. They've gone out the farthest, and they're the shield-forming kind of lavas. So they make the, the beginning of that shield-shaped dome. Um, the margins of these things tend to weather white. Now that's actually pretty important because there's a lot of these basalts that were mismapped in the past as felsic. But once you go hitting around and you persevere and you find a fresh surface, you see that they're actually green in the middle. They are not at all felsic. In thin section, they're absolutely beautiful with purple titanogites, um, olivines, and they have a very crystalline ground mass. There's also uh, amygdales in many of them. Uh, filled with carbonate or zeolite or quartz. Uh, let's see. Yep, that's what I want to say about that. And then the pyroclastic deposit, these mafic pyroclastic deposits, they, again, they have these um, beautiful sort of fluidal and roundish shapes of scoria, which is, again, mafic pumice. So it's something that's vesicular. It's spewed out in this kind of a um, aerated fountain from a basaltic cone or from the main vent. And we also found burnt wood in these deposits. So we know that they are hot enough to burn wood. Um, and when you look at them in thin section, uh, these are, this is plain light, this is cross-polarized light, and in cross-polar light they're opaque, which means they're glass. So there's real glass still existing 15 million years later. Um, nice flow banding in a lot of these scoria glass. So this is sort of a, um, you've got ash in there and you've got pieces of scoria. There are also mafic intrusions, gabbros, um, that are beautiful blocky intrusions, uh, blocky outcrops, and again, more equigranular, but again, uh, titanogite and uh, some olivine in there, and these beautiful lath-shaped uh, plagioclases. Okay, the, ma the uh, mafic stuff uh, deposits had a very interesting result in the magnetics. So normal, normally most basalts and uh, mafic units tend to have 
quite a bit of magnetite in them. So here's an example. You've got magnetite. As a result, they tend to be magnetic highs on the geophysics, which is red, right? Blues are low, reds are high. Well, interestingly, uh, we did this traverse out here, and we kept finding basalts, but they're blue. You're like, what the heck's going on? Well, they look exactly like the other basalts, but um, after talking to our geophysicist and looking at them, it turns out that it's actually a little bit more purple along here. It's a little bit of a different blue, and it turns out these are reversely polarized. So the Earth's magnetic field, the magnetic pole is in the south end rather than in the north like it is today. That happened a lot in the Miocene, and uh, we have a great example of it here. So we, kn we know that the poles have reversed probably multiple times during the eruptions of this volcano. So that's pretty exciting. And uh, we're hoping that maybe uh, some of our geophysicists might be able to put together a picture of actually, you know, might get a record of how many times it, uh, it flipped. Again, um, okay, so here's, uh, let's look at the, the felsic to intermediate deposits now. Again, we've divided the, fa the volcanic facies into coherent and volcanic classic. The coherent tend to be uh, lava flow deposits as well as intrusions. Domes, dome just means a round uh, body, and uh, volcanic clastic, a couple different, several different kinds of volcanic clastic deposits. The coherent deposits, they tend to form, they're really erosion resistant. These are the things that are left. These are the things that make the beautiful spires in Warren Bungle Park. They make these gorgeous domes, uh, the big spires, and they're also very commonly columnar jointed. And if you notice, these columns are actually horizontal. And there are places, and none of the pictures could show up enough, but, the, but you can see radial columns. So the columns form perpendicular to the cooling surface. So if you have a dome forming, and you, have, you, can, you often make these radial columns. So it's pretty, pretty fun to see. In uh, hand sample and thin section, these things are um, anything from equigranular to porphyritic. They've got large phenocrysts, and these phenocrysts tend to be uh, anorthoclase, most commonly. Um, again, these are the anorthoclase, but we also see some feldspathoids, which are silica undersaturated uh, minerals that like lucite that are opaque in thin section. And you'll see that in all of these, the ground mass is incredibly crystalline. And they tend to show you the flow foliation of these lavas. They're absolutely impressive. The other things we see in these, because they're alkaline, we get these really beautiful uh, amphiboles and pyroxenes in them uh, that are sodic. So we have the sodic amphibole is our fedsonite, and the uh, sodic pyroxene is called adrene. And this is in thin section, when you're looking in the microscope, you can never get it to transfer right, is an absolutely spectacular blue. It's just this aqua blue. And the adrene is bright green. So they're just beautiful rocks, but again, they're very, very crystalline. So they, they had to have been pretty viscous, pretty thick. An interesting thing that we saw in several of the thin sections and several of the uh, outcrops is two foliation planes. And now these things have not undergone a regional foliation. They're too young. So I started wondering what the heck was going on. And then we started looking at this thin section. Here you can see that, again, we, we see this flow foliation that the ground mass crystals are forming and the phenocrysts, right? So the thing is flowing along, and all the crystals are aligning with this sort of thick, crystal-rich flow. Well, next thing that we see is this dark 
uh, planar, these crystals that are um, actually our fed snipe at this point, and they're at quite an angle. But if you look closely, you can see that these phenocrysts are getting entrained into these, um, into these planes. So the way that we're interpreting this is if you get a lava is flowing, making this flow foliation in the crystals, then there seems to be some sort of load on this, and you get a shear, uh, shear foliation, or a flow shear, you might call it. And then later, you've got sodic-rich fluids that percolate <coughs> through and crystallize these arfedsonite through it. So it's a very interesting process. Um, I'm not sure if uh, I've never, I haven't read about it before, but um, maybe somebody else has. The other thing that we have are cyanide intrusions. So these are felsic intrusions. Cyanite technically is a rock that is almost all case bar, very little, very little quartz. Um, these things are medium grain. They're they're not fine grain like the other ones, and they're not porphyritic. They're equigranular. That's what they look like in outcrops. And in thin section, these things are absolutely amazing. They are uh, quite coarsely crystalline in that, and they have these graphic textures, so intergrown graphic textures, quartz and case bar. The quartz, there is quartz, but it's very, very late, and it's interstitial. It's in between the minerals. But the other thing that's really phenomenal is in some of these, you see this resorption texture of the quartzes, and this stuff in the middle is made up of quartz and uh, apatite and uh, hematite. So we have silica, iron, phosphate fluid. So what we think has happened is these things have been resorbed and then they recrystallize in the presence of a iron phosphate silica immiscible melt. So that's Something for the petrologists to ponder. Autoclastic um, breaches, we see these not limited to the felsic volcanic rocks. They're also with the mafic ones. But this is one of the most beautiful examples I've ever seen. Nice, beautiful, coherent lava here, a trachyte. And all around it are busted up pieces of that lava. In some cases, they're basically jigsaw fit, so all the, the uh, uh, fragments sort of fit together. And these things occur when a lava is flowing along, the crust cools, and that crust then gets busted up as the lava continues to, to flow. And uh, you can also get them in sills, but basically that, that outer rind breaks up and you can have jigsaw fit, and you can have rotated clasps. Again, these are not uh, these are not restricted to the felsic units, but this is just a beautiful example of it. We also see um, pyroclastic deposits. They're made of they're massive to weakly bedded. They contain uh, glassy fragments and a number of different kinds of fragments, but they basically they they're all felsic. Felsic volcanic fragments, felsic coherent fragments, so they're trachytes and rhyolite, and they're closely packed. And again, I'm showing you the cross polar because it's full of glass, it's black. So, this is what it looks like in plain light, this is cross polar light. And the way that I'm interpreting these, because they're, they're low volume, they're, some of them are weakly bedded, is that these things are what we call block and ash flow. They're pyroclastic deposits formed by the uh, fracturing and explosion of lava domes, of felsic lava domes. As they grow, they are full of volatiles. The pressure builds. Once they crack, they fracture the dome, that is. It decompresses immediately. You get an explosion, and you get a pyroclastic flow. This is Merapi volcano. Pyro the uh, pyroclastic flow hugs the ground, and you end up with these small pyroclastic flow deposits, which are full of dense, relatively dense class, not super vesicular, and ash. So they're called block and ash flows. 
All right. We also have another kind of volcanoclastic facies um, that I'm just, it's a polymictic breccia made up of lots of different kinds of clasts. It's in the central area, the central valley of the volcano. And it's full of a lot of different class types. We've got these felsic coherent class, just like we saw in the, um, the block in Asheville, but we see other kinds of deposits as well. We see, we see, sorry, class as well. Some of the class have pyrite in them in varying amounts. This is reflected light. You can see um, the stuff that's bright, almost white, yellow, is uh, pyrite. So we've got pyrite in class, we've got pyrite in the matrix. And we also have biotite schist class. Now, the last time I checked, there weren't any biotite schists in the Surratt or the Gunnivaut Basin. So probably this might be Lachlan origin. Here we are at the center of the volcano with class from units that are very probably quite old. We're looking at vent. We're looking at vent proximal stuff, stuff that's been brought up by the vent and tossed around. It's got pyrite in it. Uh, fluids like to circulate around vent areas, and those fluids tend to be sulfur rich or in a volcano. So we've got pyrite, we've got class from quite down deep. We're looking at the vent area, which is really convenient because we're right in the middle of the volcano. <laughs> and then the other kind of another kind of volcanoclastic deposit we see on the margins of the volcano, like as you're going from Kunubarabra into into uh, Warm Bungle Park are lahar deposits, volcanic mud flows. They've got big blocks, big boulders, uh, mixed sediment, sedimentary mm -hmm. class. And in this case, we actually have uh, burnt logs. These are probably redeposited pyroclastic deposits, um, but they are uh, uh, redistributed. And we hear these are just chaotic. They're chaotic. They're definitely mud flow kind of mass flow deposits. Okay, so all that put together, what does that mean? Well, this is what we started with. We started with undifferentiated volcanic rocks. This is uh, with the LIDAR um, overlay. And here's the map today. So this is what we have come up with. Um, as you can see, there's quite a few more units. There's a lot more detail. Um, this is the legend to the map, and I don't expect you to read everything, but basically we've got felsic to mafic. We do have a few areas that are still undifferentiated. We weren't able to get there, and we weren't able to interpret from all our base data as to what they might be. We've got pyroplastic, pyroclastic deposits and the undifferentiated. And then We also changed the basement geology a little bit. We modified that as well. Uh, we changed the contact. If you look at the central area of the volcano, that's changed quite a bit. So the volcanic rocks encroach basically where that red circle is. And then we actually have more sandstone, this green, farther out. But then we have Thankfully, we have volcanic rocks in the middle of the volcano. That really bothered me when we first went out there. Like, how can we not have any? Luckily, we have a lot. Um, so we changed those contacts a bit. And we've also identified more. So here again, this is where we'd seen the Gunada Basin, the Permian stuff. Uh, you can't see it very well, but these, if you can see these blue circles, those are now out, what we've identified as outcrops of that, of the Gunnedah Basin rocks. And the other thing that's pretty neat is those things are, uh, as has been known, are glossopterous bearing. So they've got these beautiful leaves, so that's how you identify them. But they also are interbedded with these amazing deposits, which are very highly explosive 
volcanic clastic deposits. So these are bubble wall shards when you have a vesicular law of magma and it explodes in a very explosive eruption. You end up with hummus, which are these guys up here, and these busted up pieces of what, were, what the bubbles were, so bubble wall shard. Um, and here we have what I think is a spherulitic uh, coherent clast, and this is just all shards. So this is an outcrop where we have a theami, so a eroded out piece of an old pumice. So pretty cool stuff. And we also, um, I talked about the dikes, the, the LIDAR. Um, Alexa sharply noted all these dikes. We went out and looked at them, and we saw them in the field, and they're generally all felsic. And the pattern is absolutely amazing. They're all radial. They've never been identified to this degree. So what's that telling us? Well, this is suggesting we also have, as you can see, the topography this is, this is pretty high. This has moved up a bit. So we think we have inflation that's created these radial uh, fractures that have been infilled by the dikes. Um, we also dis, um, identified, this was the Central Valley prior to our map. And here it is after our map. And in particular, so these are lava flows. Um, in particular, uh, this unit is the polymictic one with the pyrite in it. But we also identified this deposit, which is post-volcanic, but it's been eroded. So our interpretation is that this is uh, probably the walls of the crater uh, came down in a massive mass movement landslide deposit. So it's probably neogene to Pleistocene. Okay, so what did we figure out from all this mapping? Well, we revised the basement units. We changed locations of the various, the Perloa and the, and the uh, Pilaga. We also identified some of these Kalindi beds, which I didn't go into, but um, take my word. Um, we also identified again a lot of these pumice-rich Permian deposits. We revised the volcanic units. In fact, we actually uh, came up with quite a few different, more facies than we had before, other than undifferentiated. We've got coherent and volcanic clastic. We identified a dome collapse, pyroclastic uh, deposits, and vent proximal facies, radial dikes, and uh, again, and also we identify quite a few faults as well as the, um, the dikes. And some of these lineaments are actually quite big um, that are probably uh, deep basement lineaments, but um, I probably don't have time to go into that now. Just a couple examples of changes. This was some beautiful sketch maps that uh, uh, Duggan and Knudsen did of Mount Exmouth. Um, so you can see that the changes um, from before and after. And then Mopra rock, more pryoclastic, just different, sort of more detailed, more volcanic facies have been identified. I also um, played with cross sections. Um, this is the location. The long one is south, uh, what's that, west to northeast. That's these. And then the, um, other, the shorter one is here that goes through um, Grand High Tops, which is where one of the most popular walking tracks is. So that sort of um, thankfully confirmed what we'd sort of seen as this big shield shape. This is a little cartoon on top of the cross section. Here's the vent area. And it gave us a pretty good picture of what the volcano probably uh, looked like. All right, so from all these data, from all this mapping, uh, this is the evolution of the volcano as uh, I'm playing with it today. Um, we had the prior basin rocks that were gently dipping to the west. 
We, pro we had an updoming, possibly early, possibly late. Don't know that really. Then we had the, the shield forming phase, which were the mafic lavas and the mafic pyroclastic deposits, but also intermediate lava, so mafic to intermediate. And that's an interesting thing about warm bungles. There are quite a few intermediate composition things uh, at the bottom of the shield. Once we had the shield formed, then we had cross-cutting uh, more felsic units. We had uh, cyanide and gabbro intrusions. We have domes, we have domes exploding, we've got sills. We certainly have more viscous, more uh, intrusions. We also had mud flows that were happening probably at the time of the volcano, uh, but also uh, post volcanism. And we had these pyrite uh, sulfur rich fluids that were circling around the, circulating around the vent that we see uh, evidence of in that uh, central deposit. And we had some sort of an inflation and radial dikes forming. I didn't really show the inflation well in, in this episode, but the radial dikes that then formed. And then we had, of course, erosion of the volcano. And of course, the vent is going to be a lot more uh, easily eroded because of all the alteration from those vent fluids. And then we had those late landslides and crater fill deposits. So what do we know of the whole thing? We know that we have a hotspot volcano, a central type intraplate hotspot volcano. We know that it was a shield that got cut by felsic things. And uh, with lots of lahars, we have quite a few uh, deposits there. We know that the rocks were alkaline and they were formed from magmas that were a single differentiation trend. We know that there was, they're quite evolved, that there was case bar fractionation mm -hmm. late in the magmatic history. We know that there was an inflation and, and diking event. And then we know that we had um, explosive activity and, and uh, landslide mass movement activity. All of these were told to us by all the volcanoclastic deposits. So those volcanoclastic facies were very important in understanding the evolution of the volcano. And that is it. Thanks very much. Uh, so are there any questions for either Kate or Alexa? Did the radial dike point to the center? Yeah, well, I think that um, if you look back at this, let's see if I can go quickly. Oh, yeah, this one's better. Yeah, whoops. So you can see, and it's the graphics on this screen aren't showing very well, but you can see that all these pink lines very conveniently point right to the center of the volcano. Did you join them up? Uh, I didn't I'm need skeptical. to. <laughs> That's all right. Because there's no question that there's also dikes that have followed other lineaments. Right. You know, there's no question about that. It's just that we certainly do see this radial pattern. Mm. Yeah. And of course, nothing's perfect, right? No, no. How much erosion do you think has occurred? What do you mean by how much? I how mean, much I. Come off the top of oh yeah, um, I think that you know, I didn't measure it, but I think that the thing was probably at least a kilometer high. Um, whoops. Ah. It's on the other one. Yeah, yeah. So that is seven hundred meters. Right, and so you know that there's quite a bit more that was up there, so at least a kilometer, I would imagine, which is on the order of, you know, in terms from from the ground surface up, it could be you know quite a bit more, but I think that's a pretty uh, conservative estimate. 
Hey, that was really an excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, very impressive. Um, the but. Warren Bungles <laughs> have already identified in national geo heritage as being nationally significant. Mm -hmm. Doing a self-assessment of the work you've undertaken, yeah. to what extent have you been able to establish the international significance of the Warren Bungles beyond what was already considered? Well, um, I think, you know, basically any information that we can learn about hotspot hot spot volcanoes, and I say hotspot because, of course, everybody wants to fight any kind of terminology, but um, anything that these hotspot volcanoes, um, finding this kind of information on the east coast of Australia is going to that's similar to things that are in Kenya and similar to other volcanoes worldwide. It's always more information. It's always going to be um, helpful to the volcanology world um, in or anywhere. Yeah. Joe? I was just going to ask, how, how does it compare to other shield hotspot type volcanoes along the same trend? It, do you think this was one of the biggest ones, or do you think that it's just one of Oh, I think it's one of many, but um, so for example, Paul Ashley's done some work on uh, uh, Ebor. Did I pronounce that correctly? Um, and that volcano, a good half of it's gone. Um, and then there's Canobolus, and I mean, there's all these. They haven't been looked at. They haven't been mapped in any detail. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot more to learn about the ones here in Australia, a lot. And uh, I don't know that Warren Bungle is any bigger than uh, any of the other ones. It certainly has more left. That's good. I think we'll uh, finish with Boyd, and then if there's any other questions, grab um, Kate afterwards. Kate, I'm interested in the uh, faulting that you mentioned. Yep. Is that a regional overprint or associated with the volcanism or perhaps even associated with erosion? Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I think the faulting is, um, you know, well, we have we have at least two different uh, scales of faulting that I can see, and one is that there's these huge basement linears, and um, if I go back really quickly to the beginning of the talk, um, when we looked at the geophysics, um, there was. Uh, a very large magnetic high right over uh, the park. Sorry, could have probably gotten out and gone back in. Um, and I think that what we can see with, from that, so if here's the park, look at this. All right, so these are actually cut off quite well. And there's smaller linears that are parallel to that. So I think this is telling us something about the basement. We've got um, large bodies under the volcano that are probably the magmatic reservoir. And these are probably, although there's a hot spot, I think there's also probably basement lineaments that these things were in, intruded along or erupted along. So. And then you also have smaller scale faulting, and that's going to be just from uh, tectonic activity. Uh, we'll leave it there, sorry. Um, uh, thank you to both Kate for presenting and Kate and Alexa for doing the work. It was truly fantastic work, and if it doesn't make you want to get out and, and trudge around Warren Bungles, I don't know what will. Uh, <laughs> if you do have any questions, uh, we'll be in the room for a few more minutes while I finish up the recordings. Otherwise, you're more than welcome to come and bend uh, Kate's ears about the lineaments and the fluid-filled demons that are now absolutely hot spots at Brilliant fluid-filled demons. Sorry, buoyant fluid-filled <laughs> demons. Uh, but for now, please join me in thanking both Kate and Alexa. <laughs> and I'll hopefully see you next month. Thank you. Uh oh. Yeah, there we go.